I have to say before we begin, all my favorite people are here, all of them, in one room, including Jerry. So this, this is an auspicious event. Um, so I do want to thank the Cooper Hewitt and Rookie and Kara and Kim for having us here and all the work that they've done to, to get us here and make us so comfortable. Um, so we're here today to celebrate Jerry and her lifetime of quite remarkable uh, creative production. So Cat Cat Mirror, who is unfortunately <laughs> at her sister's wedding. Not unfortunate for her, unfortunate for me, because it's usually the road show yeah. is the three of us. Yeah. We call it our great dog and pony show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, Kat and I, with two other special guests here, Diana Murphy and Jordan Steingart, um, started this project together. Um, it seemed to us that recognition of Jerry among design iconoclasts had gone missing. We wanted to put Jerry back in the public eye where she definitely belonged. Um, we went through a treasure trove of work, drawings, sketches, <laughs> models, photos, publications, and letters that luckily Jerry had held on to. Fabrics, absolutely, <laughs> lots of fabrics, clothing that somebody modeled. Um, so here's the book right here. So the book is 224 page volume, brimming with images, organized into three sections. Um, so the first section, early years, covers their education in Memphis, followed by MFA studies at Cranbrook Academy of Art, where she was immersed in an ethos of design without disciplinary boundaries. It also includes the beginnings of her career in the styling division of General Motors and her move to Los Angeles to become director of interiors at Victor Gruen Associates. Section two focuses on the main part of Jerry's career. It starts in 1964 when Jerry formed her office, Jerry Cavanaugh Designs, in a studio space that she shared with architect Frank Gehry and Greg Walsh. It includes the multitude of diverse projects that she undertook from store interiors, offices and residences, textiles and papers, wrapping papers, furniture, exhibitions, toys and products to graphics and so much more. Third and final section, Jerry's World, shares her more personal work, the delightful handcrafted objects, her own homes that were playgrounds for ideas, and finally, her stunningly beautiful and colorful still life drawings. Throughout the book are lively anecdotes from those who have worked with Jerry and have often become lifelong friends. Their stories help to give the readers a better sense of Jerry's indomitable personality. Also included throughout the book are a few of the many, many articles about Jerry and her work, including <laughs> ones that appeared in the LA Times, House Beautiful and Cosmopolitan, as well as Interiors and Women's Wear Daily. Adding fun and flair throughout the book are numerous delightful photographs of her many-hued personality. So that's the book, but as we have Jerry here today, we have a great opportunity to talk to her about some particular areas of her work and some dominant motifs. So what we're going to talk about today is interiors, textiles and papers, vernaculars and craft, and finally flowers and nature. Behind us, there'll be a looping slideshow of images, so if you miss something, it'll come back around. The presentation and discussion will be about 40 minutes, and then we'll have about 10 minutes or so for your questions, so save those up. So we'll start off with interiors. In 1952, you joined General Motors. Uh, your work there included designing trade shows and model kitchens for Frigidaire. Then in 1960, you moved to Los Angeles to become head of interiors at Victor Gruen Associates, as I just mentioned. It was there that you were introduced to the culturally momentous Joseph Magnin stores, known for shifting the shopping experience, as you put it, from chic chic to chic fun. In 1964, you went on to form your own office, Jerry Cavanaugh Designs, designing even more Magnin stores, as well as residential and office interiors, 
among so many other things. You've described the period to me from the 50s to the 1970s or so when you did this work as a particularly wondrous period for design. Just one example is the project that you did for GM's Feminine Auto Show. Um, the exhibit there, you put 100 live canaries yes. in net towers. <laughs> yes. So that seems pretty magical. So can you describe why this period was so remarkable for you? Well, it was a remarkable time in our country, and it was a remarkable time in Detroit where really part of modernism started, and that was because of Cranbrook. Associated with that was the Saarinen office, the Victor Gruen office, and the Yamasaki office, and the Detroit Art Institute, plus Alexander Gerard doing work out in, in Gross Point and forming his own office. I just thought that was the normal world. <laughs> no, I'm serious about it, but it was very lively, and there was a lot of exchange with them among these offices, and there was such a curious curiosity about it, and you wanted to know what everyone else was doing, and you followed up on it. Besides, there were a lot of interesting folk art stores at the time. And of course, this was all sort of paved in a way by Alexander Girard living in Groats Point and establishing his own office. But then he also worked for Saren, and so there was an interplay of these different offices. And the Gruen office, who had really invented the shopping center, and produced so many jobs for people. I think half of a town and half of Los Angeles supported people by shopping center. It was very innovative. And a lot of innovative work that then spun off into major planning work. And this was all interlaced with Yamasaki's know, office, Saarinen's office, and even uh, the General Motors Tech Center, which a friend of mine here has recently designed a book or written a book, and it's coming out in September. And it's called Well, the World Tomorrow Meets Today. And so I encourage you all to, to buy it. But that was the flavor of what was happening at the time. And I don't know of another area in the country where this was happening. So, well, that, <laughs> so my next question was actually going to be about the difference in the design scenes between Los Angeles, Detroit, and New York. Yes. Do you want to say something about that? Well, you would see. I got criticism from people saying that I was going out to the West Coast and I was going to be working sort of for the enemy. They were crazy. <laughs> and they thought, most of the people back here, I'm sorry to say, thought uh, the West Coast was sort of next to China <laughs> because of the cartoon that was on the, in the New Yorker about it. And so, but it has now changed, and people now want to come out, and we say, please don't come out, we're too crowded. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how would you describe what the differences were between Los Angeles, Detroit, and New York? Well, there is a, was a ferment in, in the Detroit area that I don't think has ever been replaced. The New York area was sort of like, I'll tell you a funny experience that I had, and that was there was the uh, head of UCLA was Franklin Murphy, who was a real mover and shaker in the LA scene. When this is after, this is way after, and I didn't have anything to do with it. But one day I saw 
Franklin in the sculpture garden at UCLA because I was walking my dogs. And I knew him through Hallmark because he was on the board of Hallmark, which I did a lot of work for at one time. And I said, Franklin, what's the matter? You look really gross and you're grumpy. And he says, <laughs> It's that goddamn track thinking. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean by track thinking? He said, oh, yes, you do. It's Boston, New York, Washington, <laughs> Philadelphia, <laughs> and it's all they can think is on that track and nothing else. And I understood that because then I used that in lectures in relationship to color because I grew up in the South, and that was a different viewpoint. And also, I knew a lot of people in Chicago, and that was industrial thinking. And you come out across the West, and you go over the mountains, and you came to the West Coast, and it was a freer time of thinking. And as I talked at a, a conference several years ago with my dinner partner, and it was one of Neutra's sons, and I asked him what he thought was the difference. And he said the West Coast was more flexible. And I still yeah. think that. I, I, I would agree with you. More flexible. Yeah. <laughs> So um, you would also kind of set up this next question, Jerry, which yeah. is about the other thing you and I have talked about um, was about retail design. And you had mentioned to me that you and a few others, including Frank Gehry, actually found retail design exciting, where a lot of designers looked down their nose at it. Well, that was retail, and that was, goes back to an old English term, that's trade. Oh, and that was a bunch of nonsense, yeah. as far as I was concerned, and a bunch of nonsense for some of the people that I knew, and certainly was for the Gruen organization, what they did. So and what it, was exciting about it? It was, there were more things that were looser in one sense, not bad loose, but looser mm -hmm. in thinking and experimental, it wasn't what I call box thinking. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of box thinking, and in some ways it was good, in some ways it was bad, and that was because of the Eastern schools of thinking, and I mean that by at Yale, Harvard, and MIT, and that was all out of a certain kind of what I call box thinking. And particularly with color, and this is one of my hue and cries today, <laughs> it's that it's not Unintended. taught in architectural schools at all. And so architects grow up with white construction paper, corrugated cardboard, black paper, and maybe a few textures, and that's it. And they I, invariably, if I give a lecture, they say, oh, some architect will raise their hand and they'd say, what's the best system for working in color? And I say, this. <laughs> <laughs> so Jerry, we're gonna go on to this next section here. We're gonna talk about textiles and yeah. papers. Um, so you started working with textiles and, and papers when you were quite young and your devotion to textiles and papers has lasted throughout your career. In the mid-70s, you started your own line of textiles. Um, how did you decide to start Geraldine Fabrics? Where did the ideas for the different patterns come from? Well, the idea, I mean, like oranges, which, which we, we Cooper showed, you yeah. had bought. I lived in the country of oranges. And I have an orange tree in my own backyard. A lot of people do. Orange trees, avocado trees, lemon trees. So I tried to develop it based on things that were sort of indigenous to the area. So the patterns that are in yep. this line, yep. that's where they came from. So how did you imagine they'd be used? Well, that's easy. <laughs> I mean, there are so many ways that you can use them. And that was the idea that each person that bought it 
we could use it in an inspirational kind of way. It would inspire them to do it because they were lively and colorful. And when I came to Southern California, I was overwhelmed with color because you would see whole mountains in yellow. You would see whole mountains in lupin, you know, which were, and so flowers, that yeah. impressed me very, very much in relation. An ice plant, I've never seen an ice plant before, but there is now a term called highway ice plant pink. You know? Yeah, it's this very fluorescent pink. Yeah. Was, so when you when it's in bloom, you just like everything is glowing. Yeah, and you'd see it cascading over down a mountain. I never saw a color like that back here or in the south. I saw a lot of cotton because I was raised in cotton, but that was all white. But to come to California and see masses, I mean, mountains of it just overwhelmed me. So one particularly significant and long-term client was Isabel Scott Fabrics. Yeah. Um, here we go with some of the Geraldine Fabrics. Um, so you started working for them in the late 50s, and most your most significant project for them was the Choreo Silk line of ECAT fabrics that you developed in the late 1960s in South Korea. It was a really complex project. Not only did you design the ECATs, but you were also involved in setting up the factory that would, would produce the special weaving technique. Can you describe how unusual this project was? Well, to me, it wasn't unusual. It was just the way my mind thought and the challenge that was presented to me. And so I took up the challenge, and I had a very good, interesting time. I even got to play the palace in Seoul. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the uh, Korean prince and princess lived in the uh, palace and he was a prince who had to work to support his grandmother's ladies in waiting. <laughs> I'm not kidding on this. And he was an architect and he uh, was under, his, well first of, well any, uh, I'm getting off on too many other stories but um, the uh, um, the experience of Koryo silk, which there are, is one of the patterns called Chunchon Mountains. And the mountains in Chunchon, whoops, went like this, like that, out of the ground. And that was something I based one of the designs on. Then there was Magpion. I was so overwhelmed at seeing Korean ceramics because I had been brought up basically on Japanese ceramics. But then I began to see Korean ceramics, and I said, well, I know where they got it in Japan. It was from <laughs> the Koreans. And there is one design, Mike Beyond, that's based on it. And then some of the Chevron was based on some paintings on a ceiling in a temple. So. It all fitted in, and, and Koryo Clouds was based on a badge, because the Koreans wore badges to designate what they did. This was in the government. I keep hitting this, I don't mean to. I can't help talking with my hands. Yes. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, it, it all was on that, and it was a fabulously interesting experience, because uh, even with color, like, um, there was one yellow that was based on a plant that blooms in the spring, and it also blooms in the south. And I based a whole part of the color line on that yellow. But you had to, I, I'm, I'm just so curious about having to set up the production so that it could do the, the ECAT. Well, weapon. that was my secret. <laughs> Oh, I see. <laughs> and we're not going to hear it. It really is my yeah. secret because nobody has done it. And I, it yeah. might be revived again 
in the Philippines, and it's, I'm hanging by my eyelashes because there is a lady who was uh, from the Bay Area, and she came across my silks and the Corio silks, and the equipment was sold to from this Korean to another Korean to another Korean, then she bought it and took it to the Philippines. Wow. And she yeah. is now in the process of setting up a factory outside of Manila. And if when that gets done, uh, there will be a revival of some of those prints. That would be remarkable. Yeah, it would be remarkable. And but not, I shouldn't even be telling you this because I'm superstitious. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to ask you about, Jerry, yeah. is something I think you've also talked about, which is that using fabrics, and I'm assuming wallpaper as well, architecturally, can you talk about how you've thought about them and used them to change a space? And Well, we've been doing this from eternity. As long as it's been there, it's been the fabrics, you know. There's somebody recently who was telling me about an up-and-coming exhibition about the interiors of, of, of pyramids. And they were chucked full of textiles because textiles were a, also a symbol of wealth because it took so much to do and make them. I mean, they're not tried by any means whatsoever. The process of doing textiles, and Dorothy of Noel is here, and she could tell you oodles about that. And it's very interesting. It is not just a piece of fabric, you know. It's much more than that. If you know the process, you would not have that attitude. It's, it's a miracle, not only a miracle, it's one of the, the highs of civilization, mm -hmm. is textiles. So you think of the Peruvian textiles, the Andes textiles, and other textiles throughout the world. They're ingenious, mm -hmm. and they now know that the uh, textiles, the development of textiles, predates the Bronze Age because they have found evidence of it in, in, uh, in mer uh, fabric merged in clay and has been, and there's a lady who's uh, formally connected with Occidental who's done a lot of research on it. Fascinating. It is fascinating. It is so fascinating. And you're a wealth of knowledge, Jerry. Yeah, I love it. I love that in color. And there's so much in relationship in the history of color, how color changed from a gray world to a bright world, and how um, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, commissioned the buccaneers to not steal gold, but to steal hardwood from the, what we know as the British, uh, uh, British Honduras, because the center of heartwood is a very red bark, and it was a stable red that could reach England. It's, it's, that goes along with Coach Neal. And vegetables. <laughs> That's another thing. Which people are reviving. It's, yeah. it's interesting. It's very so, interesting. I'm Jerry. very interested now, right now, in doing avocado pink. Yeah. You wouldn't think of avocados being associated with pink. I want to see that, Jerry. Yeah, well, I've been playing with it with a neighbor of mine. And, and so <laughs> I'll say, save your avocado seeds, please, for me. <laughs> so, Jerry, I want to um, ask you, about something that you also mentioned at the beginning, yeah. which is vernacular and folk. Yeah. Um, so you have a passion for vernacular design, the language of the everyday, and what's been referred to as folk art. Yeah. 
more complex. Um, the passion, this passion was the subject of Home Sweet Home, American Domestic Vernacular Architecture, an exhibition that was conceived by you and co-curated with the architect Charles Moore. You Charles also, Moore. Yes. Um, you also designed the exhibition Islands in the Land, which featured the traditional objects of Appalachia and the Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico. Uh, your home is also chock full of folk collections, and many of the products um, you've made seem inspired by handcraft and by folk. So first of all, can you describe the difference between works of design, craft, and folk? In your opinion, is there any No, difference? I don't see any really difference. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that really sort of tied this all together was last year in the New York Times, it was January the 8th, there was a review of a book called Craft, yeah. C-R-A-E-F-T. That's the original spelling. It has degenerated down to uh, sort of, uh, I hate them, is uh, uh, sort of macrame wall hangings that came out <laughs> uh, during the hippie period. But it's not. It means making the very best. And a lot of what you call folk art is making the very best out of what is available. So it's not itsy-bitsy, crafty stuff at all. It has a much higher meaning. And when, it, and when my study of vernacular architecture, when you see the processes of how some of the buildings were built, because it was just what was available, and they made the best out of it, that's craft. So. Um you mentioned your childhood, which yep. is when it seems like this love of vernacular yes. started. So you've talked about like noticing things in your neighborhood in Memphis, the way homes were built. So can you talk about the things? Well, that I you... designed a chair, which I have not really successfully gotten anyone to produce it, but it's based on the details of the neighborhood that I live in, in Los Angeles, which was built in 1886. And they were all either craftsman houses or pattern book houses. And this is the details of that chair. So it had a strong influence. And some of it is just a vernacular architecture. I'm sorry I didn't continue more with that because mm -hmm. Every once in a while, I'll find something that's really interesting that I didn't know about when I was doing the, ex the exhibition with Charles Moore. We did do a book a, uh, on the uh, exhibition, which was in 13 different venues in Los Angeles. And Ritz Oatley published our book on it through the Craft and Folk Art Museum. And it sold out in six months. And, but Ritz Oatley would not give us the, to go into the second printing because they did not want to give us the same royalty, so it didn't get published. <laughs> and now it's a collector's item. So that, that show is really remarkable. Can you talk about um, the role of the different individual exhibitions? And then there was the conference at UCLA. Yes, we had a symposium. It was sort of like we put out the word and people wanted to do certain sections of, of it. There was the front porch, which the front porch really is an American vernacular situation. It stemmed out of the so-called, that weren't porches, but um, on classical buildings with the columns, and there was a little space in between. But in this country, it developed to be the front porch. And the front porch, to me, is a fabulous communication place. Because if you live in an area that has a front porch, 
and you walk, this is in my neighborhood, walk. You sit and you talk, or you stop and talk with people on your front porch. It's, a, it's more than just a piece of architecture. It's a means of communication. So a few things that I do want to mention about this show. So, yeah. you know, so it's back behind us here. So yeah. it included things like the kinds of like playhouses that children build yeah. and all the weird things that we especially see in Los Angeles done with stucco. Yeah. Um, so here are more images, the children's architecture over here and uh, one of these odd homes with turrets um, that we find in Los Angeles. So uh, there was a... So I guess I want to know about what these individual shows were that were taking place. Well, all over one Los of Angeles. them was this one, and this was uh -huh. oh no, that's some other exhibition. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, it goes back to sort of like it's a, almost a car mentality in the aspect that you can you're free to do anything. That's actually what the car symbolizes in Southern California. You can go anywhere. Nobody stops you. you di we didn't have a subway system like you all had for your, or Paris. Paris had a subway system way, way before anybody else. But were each of these exhibitions different? That yes, covered each one, one of them was okay. different. Okay. And we brought in people from um, many disciplines to talk about the systems at the symposium at UCLA. We didn't get to document it like we yeah. wanted to because there wasn't enough funds around, which is typical of a lot of exhibitions. There wasn't enough, and nor was there mentality for people to understand it, why we needed money to develop it. Um, so the Islands in the Land exhibition, so this is yeah. the, you want to describe that briefly and then talk about what you wanted people to take away from that exhibition? What do you mean take away, Louise? So when they saw these very beautiful artifacts, what did you want people to think about or know? Well, it was really based on a book on called Islands of the Land. And it was, and I can't think of Carrie his name McWilliams. right now. Carrie, oh, Carrie McWilliams, said who it was. Mm -hmm. um, and Eudora Moore took that idea and mm -hmm. took the Appalachia area and the Pueblos as two separate places, mm -hmm. which had a lot of artifacts done by artisans and the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm had a lot of things that she borrowed. We, it was an exhibition of over 1,300 square feet, no, three, one, three, comma, oh, 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 <laughs> um, square feet, whole yeah. wing of the Pasadena That's huge. Museum. Yeah. And there was about uh, 2,000 objects in the show. And they were from the Pueblos and the uh, uh, Appalachia. And those things were, again, made out of something that was available and made beautiful. It's the same way in cooking. It's not much different. You find the best way to do a cucumber soup, because yeah. that's what you <laughs> had. You know? It's in ingenuity. So, Jerry, we're going to go on to our last section here yeah. on flowers and nature. Um, so you've done a number of projects um, in which, oh, so flowers and nature have been a motif in your work from the beginning. Um, they dominate both your professional and personal work. Um, coincidentally, all, all this work also shows your accomplishment in a wide and vast range of media, from textiles, books, illustrations, mosaic murals, sculptural elements, wallpapers, rugs, applique, painting, that's up here, you can see it there. Um, so you've done a number of projects in which you've supersized creatures, birds, flowers, butterflies. 
So what's the magical, fantastical world that you're imagining these objects I never inhabit? know until I start it. <laughs> <laughs> what it's going to turn out, I get an idea, and then I start sort of developing it. And I just can't help it. <laughs> I, the zinnias of that table really relate to uh, being at my cousin's place in Arkansas, where in the summertime, along one of the fences, my uncle insisted that we plant uh, zinnias, and that was our job as kids to make bouquets in the house of zinnias. Yeah. And so there was things stuck in my head. I, I can't help it. It just sticks in my head, and I feel <laughs> like I want to do something. And sometimes I just feel like I'm sort of like a conduit for I don't know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems like there's a, there's an incredible amount of joy in making nature supersize. Well, I have a good time. I like what I do. We it's, can tell. Yeah, I really like it. And somebody <laughs> said, well, what are you going to do when you retire? And I look at them <laughs> retire. <laughs> No, no way. There's too many good things to do. I yes. just hope I live long enough to do them all. And even at that, I'll probably be saying, wait, one more time. Yes. <laughs> so that's a good lead into my next question, which is you've worked in so many media. Like, you'll do anything. You know, and sometimes you're working in collaboration with others. Yeah. Sometimes you're making the things yourself. Um, and so I wanted to know about the chutzpah that this takes to feel like you can do anything. Well, I don't care necessarily if everybody receives it. I just have to do it. And I say to students all the time, if you have an idea, do it, because eventually you might have to wait 5, 10, or 20 years. Somebody will come around and recognize. But just do it. Work. So can you talk about you know, how you sort of like would figure things out or you'd figure out who to work no, with? No, it's and... just sort of like in a way, I'll read anything. I'll read a soup can <laughs> <laughs> to figure out something, but it'll stay with me. And I just, I, in a lot of ways, I remember too many things, but it's memory and curiosity. I think the best thing for a designer is to... And the artist is to have curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it's a very interesting word when you get into it. Is there is there anything that you started to get into and you felt like you were in too deep? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like if you do, it's sort of like cooking. If it doesn't work, you throw it away. <laughs> or it goes down the garbage disposal. But yeah. you just, you know. So, and you, nobody has to know about it. Let's reset that. So, <laughs> um, so some of the, but you have done a lot of things. Some of the things that you've done have been commissions. Yes. And some of the things you've just instigated your, yourself. Um, so was... Like, what gave you the sense that you could, like, put your own resources forward? And I know with the textiles that you did, Geraldine Fabrics, that that wasn't a financial success. But how was it successful for you, the things that it's you've done It's been successful to me later, but it's taken 30 years. I mean, like, uh, it wound up as at the beginning of this lecture, it's now in the Cooper Hewitt. That gives me great pleasure. Mm -hmm. To say, okay, I really wasn't wrong, and somebody finally recognized it. <laughs> and so, and I'm sure that had happened to a lot of scribes doing illumination of books, you know. And now, but we don't know about that because nobody left us any notes. 
<laughs> you know, but there's, I think, a lot of that in the world. So here's a question, Jerry, and this yeah. will be my final question, and then we can open it up for other people's questions. Um, so when you sum up your entire career, what do you feel are your most important contributions? That's a hard one, but I kind of sum it up in a way when my father first took me to art school when I was eight years old. And he said to me, I don't expect you to do anything with this, but I do expect your life to be enriched, and it has. It's been enriched in many, many ways. And a lot of the people in this room, I am grateful that they were in my life to help me enrich it. All right. Thank you. Jerry, that's a, that's a good way to end our conversation. Okay. Yeah. But Jerry, do you want to do you want to mention some of the women who were in Los Angeles? Well, there are five women that should be written about. One is June Wayne, who started the Tamron Workshop. It was the most successful of the Ford Foundation grants, and she revived lithography. There was Edith Wiley, who started the Craft and Folk Art Museum, which is now called Contemporary Craft Museum. There was Eudora Moore, who was very much instrumental in California design. And there are, I think, six or eight books that are still out on California design. And the two, what we call the black bandits, or the crazy ladies of Los Angeles. <laughs> and that was Sister Corita and yeah. Sister uh, Magdalene Mary. Yeah. And these women, five, five, six women, and there was another one, Pat Altman, who was one of the brains of LA, but nobody wrote about them. And somebody should do it. It don't take a lot of work because there are not very many of us left that can tell the stories. And one who's recently departed is Deborah Sussman. Yes, yeah. Deborah. Deb and, I'll tell you a funny story on that. And this would answer your question, is that when I first came to Los Angeles, I knew of Deborah. And I was invited to a... Uh, have an opening at the Herman Miller showroom. At that time, you could have put the whole design community in the Herman Miller showroom. Somebody <laughs> came up to me and said, uh, what do you, uh, where do you work? And No, they asked me what I, where I was, and they said, where, what company I work for, and I told them, picture growing. And then they asked me, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a designer. And he said to me, oh, you're a girl designer. There's another girl designer on the other side of the room. It was Deborah Sussman. And he took me over there, and, and Deborah and I were friends till she left us. Yeah. Yeah, and I do, I just want to also quickly mention that Victor Gruen Associates was a very forward company that he hired women, he hired people of color, so it was quite, quite remarkable, and I think that that's also a story to be told. Yeah, it is a story to be told. It's a good story, and we had a hell of a lot of fun in that office. The, uh, one time... Carl and Lubin went out and bought, at that time, sack dresses, and the few females over there had to wear the sack dresses. <laughs> what? It was a jersey thing you put over, and it was called a sack dress. But there were things like, and then I could go on and on about it. It was a really unique office. 
and smart and influential. Yeah. Yes. I wonder if you could talk about the, your relationship with the Magnin family. What? Your relationship with the Magnins. How did you seem to really click, and this was a big part of your work? How did you connect well, with the Magnins? I was lucky when I went to Irwin. I was told that there were two accounts that I couldn't work on. One was Joseph Magnins and Nordstrom, and I felt like okay. It's their company. I'll just do what they say. I'll have a good time. And, you know. So I was there about a year when Rudy Baumfeld, who really became my mentor, he used to call me his Walpaw daughter, daughter by choice, mm -hmm. um, gave me these drawings up the second floor of Joseph Magnus, and he wanted me to develop them. And so I did. And I got through with him, and he said, okay, you go up and sell it. And I was so overwhelmed, because you know, I thought that, that to me, early age, that was pretty overwhelming. And I did go up with the drawings under my arm, and I coincidentally met on the elevator the daughter of Cyril Magnin. And I didn't know it was Ellen Magnin Newman at the time. And I thought, well, she looks important. And so <laughs> I asked her if she knew where Mr. Newman's office was. And she smiled and she said, follow me. And I did. And she sat down. I sat down. And the secretary, about 10 minutes later, ushered me into Mr. Newman's office, and there was the lady that I rode up on the <laughs> elevator with. And somehow, Ellen and I became instant friends. And I try to talk to Ellen every Sunday today on the phone. But I am so, it's more than grateful. It's something else that I became so much involved with the Magnin family, that it was, it was a way of life and an education. And one of the Magnins is here today, and I am thrilled to death about that. But it was a unique place where the, a recognized talent. Andy Warhol did shoe drawings for them. Uh, Rudy Gernrich did work for them. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the innovative graphics were done by Margaret Parson. And there I could go on and on. But they were very receptive to innovation. And so that's how I became involved with them. And so I wound up staying with them all the time yeah. up there. You know, Those are the best clients and that they are also become friends. my San Francisco family. Yeah. And I wasn't pushy about it. It is one of those things that evolved. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. I wish there were another Joseph of magnets today. Mm -hmm. Yes, and now uh, we just heard that Barney's is Chapter well, one. see, Magnus was pre-parties. Yeah, pre-parties. Yes, um, Hi. Um, uh, it's a long question, but you see, um, <laughs> you really, uh, you've been very influenced by nature and flowers. So, the first part of my question is, what is your favorite, uh, your favorite flower? The second one is, have you incorporated that flower within your work? And the third part of the question is, uh, how many times have you incorporated, no, have you incorporated that flower multiple times throughout your career, and in what way? <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> so, so favorite flower, you know, have you used it, you, how have you incorporated it yep. Yep. in your work? Yeah, well, I, I got my flowers. Yeah. So who doesn't? No, but what's the favorite? I, I, I don't have a favorite. I really don't because 
if you look at it, you can always find some way to, to work around it. But there to, to you know, to develop, not work around it, develop it. At, at one point, I think that Kat and I were putting yeah. together a series yeah. of images, and we kept finding the daisy motif over and well, over again. It's easy to draw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't like to draw anything. I wish I could get back to drawing. Uh, it seems to me you draw all the time, Jerry. Well, I can do better. Yeah. <laughs> But you're, you're somebody who, as soon as you have an idea, you sketch that yes, idea I do. out. And the sketches are always beautiful yeah. in and of themselves. I'd really like to draw because that, see, that's an extension of this that goes down to here and then into the pencil. It doesn't act the same way with the computer. Mm. <laughs> I like, I like a lot of research on the computer. There's no question about that. But that ties into <coughs> looking at books going like this, down like this, finding something else. Yes. Um, so, I, I, so you've realized, or, sorry, okay. <laughs> I know that you've witnessed like a lot of different waves of feminism, and I wanted to know like how your work spoke to that, and also what advice would you give to um, a designer that's entering a male-dominated field? I can't hear you, so I don't know what you said, and I'm oh, sure okay. it's interesting. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that, can you hear me now? Can you hear me better? Can you hear me better? Okay. Okay, so I know that you've witnessed a lot of different waves of feminism, and I wanted to know how your work spoke to that, and I also wanted to know what advice you would give to a designer entering a male-dominated field. Work. Work. Yes. Everybody asks me that question, and it's just work. You know, it's fun. It's, it stretches your mind, you think. Oh, so, just work. But I, I actually want to know the answer to this about what? when you were observing these different waves of feminism, how did you observe them? So you've, you've experienced the first, what it's called the first wave, the second wave, now the third wave. So were you participating in I that? I did participate in a, for a while, and I'll tell you a funny story. I, very early on in it, I met Gloria Steinem, mm -hmm. and I was invited to one of her first fundraisers and sat across from her, and she told me that they were going to call the magazine Ms. And I looked at her. This is not racism. Please understand. I said, I was called Ms. Jerry from the time I was six years old. What a crazy way to raise them. My, a magazine, but she said they will keep it, and good for her because she has made a tent, a good tent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of the younger people always want something that they want to protest against. You've got the world laid out in front of you, more than what we did. We didn't even know about feminism. We just did it. But what point did you, you, we've talked about that you knew that you were not being the, paid the same I found as your that male out very early on. Yeah. Now, and I so, was not being paid the same amount yeah. I was being paid. Did you and say And I was anything? also told later on when I started my own business that I did not, and, but these were people later on I didn't deal with. They said, well, I mean, you, you don't need to be paid as much because you don't have responsibility. I was supporting my mother at the time. But that is what I call the sin of assumption. It's, it's the biggest sin in the world. It's assuming something happened and it didn't. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You know, so but I did need it. Yeah. Did you march? No, I <laughs> never really marched because now I couldn't do it if I wanted to. Right. <laughs> I'd have to be pushing something. But I've been outspoken about it, you know, and I think just by doing what I do has helped. And also, I was lucky in that I got support very early on from a number, and they were usually from couples that were in the design business or merchandise world that the husband knew they were going to get supper when they got home. Yeah. And that may sound funny, but it's not. And so there was this camaraderie that existed between them, and they sort of brought me into it. Yeah. And so I was lucky in that way of not being dominated just by one kind of sex, you know, mm -hmm. males. It wasn't. I was lucky enough to get commissions from couples. Right. You yeah. were you worked for women owned businesses. Yes, I yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. So the Ellen Magna Newman, um, the um, Hall and Levine, the, yeah. the advertising agency, and Isabel Scott, all women owned businesses. Yep. Yeah. But in the Magnan family, the men and the women were all equal. Very cool. Yeah. Her mother certainly was. Okay. And her father was one of the movers and shakers of the accessory world. <laughs> no, I, I get it. Yeah. It was and it started over some porcelain jars of English toffee put on the glove compartment chin uh, counter. That's how it started. I don't know whether she knows that or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jerry, we're going to thank you. Well, now. I thank so, you all for coming. It's really, yeah, no, it's really special. in so many yeah. ways. It's, uh, it's been a, like a reel of my life of remembering things that I had completely forgotten this whole experience of on the book. Yeah. Yeah. No. And what a, what a great group. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.